Jesus' parable about the seed growing on its own points to the absolute certainty of the harvest once the sower has done his job. And we're told by biblical scholars that originally this parable was meant to encourage the early Christians because not much seemed to be happening, at least not much that was good. In fact, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, a period of intense persecution began that was to last not 10 years, not 20 years, not 50 years, but 300 years. Many were tempted to lose faith and give up, and some did, but most did not. In this parable, Jesus is telling everyone to be patient, to trust, and not to expect instant results. In our own time, many people, perhaps including many of us here, are tempted to believe that the church is dying, that it has no future, that its own self-inflicted wounds caused by scandals and hypocrisy of not just the clergy, but of Catholic politicians and others in all walks of life have inflicted a deadly wound. Like the early disciples, we too want results and we want them now. We live in the age of instant product. We have instant food, we have instant coffee, we have microwave, instant photos on our cell phones, pretty much instant everything. We know that the quality often suffers in this world of instant product, but we're willing to make that sacrifice so that time and effort will be saved. It's all about convenience after all. But our age could also be called the age of the push button. All we have to do is press a button and then things will happen. Labor saving devices which we take for granted, washers and dryers and microwave ovens and frozen or processed foods, take some of the monotony and the drudgery out of our daily lives. But there's a danger. There's a danger in living in the world of the push button, of the instantaneous. Why do I say that? Because the push button encourages the minimum effort, the least cost, the shortcut approach to everything. It may lure us into always looking for the easy option even when there is no easy option, at least not if we want the genuine article. You know, certain things in life just cannot be rushed. To grow to maturity as a human is a job of a lifetime. To build a good relationship with someone takes time. To get to know one's children takes time and effort. To overcome one's sins and weaknesses take time. To establish or reestablish trust in a relationship takes time. There are no shortcuts for things such as these. In Jesus' parable for today's Mass, the farmer did his part, and his part was sowing the seed. All he could do after that was trust and be patient, and wait. But these aren't exactly easy virtues for us. And yet life calls for a lot of these virtues. Some people think that we need to be busy all the time with something as if everything depended upon us, when of course it doesn't. Of course, there are things in life that we must do that God will not do for us. But after that, we should acknowledge that we, it will go on provided that we don't block it. 
in the great processes of growth, healing, recovery, and spiritual progress, we're only the facilitators. We can plant the seed, but we can't make it grow. Only God gives the growth. We should learn patience by looking at nature. Things take time to grow, to mature, to flourish. Growth may be slow, but nothing can halt it under normal circumstances. Nature doesn't take shortcuts. All the seasons, even the harshest, are needed. And we also need all the seasons. We need the springs, we need the summers, the falls, the winters. Look at the life of Jesus before beginning his public ministry. He spent 30 years out of his 33 years at home in Nazareth, working as a carpenter. To some of us, it might seem as, as if it was a tremendous waste of time but nothing could be further from the truth. In his humanity, Jesus benefited from those years. During that time, he was growing quietly in his identity as not only the Son of Man, but the Son of God. When I was a newly ordained priest, I was assigned to Nigeria, and I went to northern Nigeria, which in many respects is straight out of the pages of the National Geographic. We had a mission on the river Niger there in a predominantly Muslim area of the country, almost exclusively Muslim. The people there were nomadic. They lived very simple lives. They lived in uh, mud and straw huts. They carved their teeth into points. They had tattoos and they disfigured their faces with hot metal picks as a sign of beauty and also as a sign of tribal demarcation. But not all the people there were Muslims. There was a minority of animus, as we called them in those days, who resisted the religion of their historic oppressors, the Muslims. Now, we Americans, by the time I got there, had been there for something like 30, 35 years. And there was an older American Dominican there from Chicago who was a very good person and a very good priest. But in talking to me privately, I had the impression from him that he couldn't see the point of our presence there. Because humanly speaking, there really wasn't anything to show for all of our work there. He thought perhaps it had been a mistake, that we should have gone to a, another part of the country that was more fertile. We were ministering there to a tribe of people called the Camberries. I've already said that they were nomads, they resisted Islam, and they lived very simple lives. They were hard to evangelize because they wouldn't tell you, usually, they didn't know themselves when they were moving. And so you'd go back uh, the following day or two days later and they were gone. They were 10 miles away. Well, let's forward 20 years now. That was about 1983, but now let's go to 2001. And at this point in my life, I'm at a Catholic university in Rome, Rome, Italy. And I'm standing in the courtyard there, and a young, tall, African man walks by me. He has facial markings, and they remind me very much of the facial markings I had seen in northern Nigeria. So I stopped him, and I introduced myself to him, and his name was Isa, and he lived across the Niger River uh, in a compound of huts about three miles from where the Dominicans were. And lo and behold, Isa was studying for the priesthood in Rome. I was utterly amazed. I never thought anything 
like that would happen after 50 years at that point of missionary work. Here standing before me was a Camberry man whose family had embraced the faith and who was studying for the priesthood. Now, that was about 20 years ago. Isa has long since been ordained to the priesthood and is in his home diocese in that part of the country, ministering to his own people successfully. If you knew how, humanly speaking, how hopeless that situation appeared to all of us Dominicans, uh, you'd appreciate how seemingly miraculous it was that any young man from that particular area of the country would ever consider the priesthood. We could have pulled out after five years, 10 years, 20 years. We stayed there 50 some years before a person like Isa emerged. And I'm not saying that's the only sign of growth because Isa's family had embraced the Catholic faith. That was just as miraculous too. So all of this is to say that God's work is certain and that we should not be too concerned with immediate results. We must indeed be patient, we must wait, and we must trust. The results are not dependent upon us in the final analysis. And I think for us as Americans, these are very countercultural things to do because we live in that culture, as I said, of instantaneous results, of push-button realities. So perhaps today in the gospel, Jesus is asking us to be content with planting small seeds in every aspect of life, from our relationships with our spouses, from our relationships with our children and with our friends and with our co-workers and our fellow parishioners. And having done so, we must then allow God to take over.